Well, hello there. My name is Jeff Harris, and I'm here for the Institute of World Affairs. And um, before we get our lecture underway, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the things that will be coming up in the next few days, and also to give you a little um, knowledge as far as what the Institute actually is. And what we are is that we're a group of students and faculty professors who um, our committee meets throughout the years, and, I mean throughout the year, and, um, usually about once a month. And our purpose is just to uh, present something, um, present an institute each week which focuses on a particular topic or a particular area of the world and try to bring speakers that can, that can give knowledge to these areas. We don't hold any specific philosophy and um, we're funded by the government of the student body. Now, all the, all the events that we present, which include like films and, and panels in the afternoon and lectures in the evening are all free to the audience. And as you can see in the brochure, we have quite a wide variety. So if there's any that you feel like attending, feel free to attend. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the next couple of evenings. We, have, we, we feel that we have some excellent speakers lined up here. First of all, tomorrow evening will be Frances Moore LePay, and she'll be talking on the topic of poverty and affluence in America. She is very noted in this topic, and she's written a few books which I think you might be familiar with. The most um, popular is um, Food for a Small Planet. And she'll be speaking basically on the changes that we're going to have to go through if we're going to meet the um, challenges of tomorrow. And then following this on Friday, we're going to be bringing in two speakers. The first of them is von Schmeling, and he is the consulate general, um, German consulate general. And he'll be speaking primarily on the topic of terrorism and its implications for freedom. And following his lecture, we're bringing in David Weisenbrot, and he's coming in from Minneapolis, and he's very um, active in the Amnesty International program. And he'll also be, he'll be kind of presenting the Amnesty International view and kind of giving a legalistic view. So I hope that these two speakers will kind of be able to give a, a balance of, of what the terrorism um, view is and also just international rights in general and how it affects the world today. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. Brian Jenkins. And he's with the RAND Corporation out of California. He served as an advisor for a number of US government um, corporations and of course his um, area of expertise is in the um, advising on terrorism and how it affects either corporations or government agencies. Um, he, is, um, wide, he has had a wide range of experience. He is known as an artist and he's been a soldier and um, painter. And he has a um, book out currently now which is entitled International Terrorism, A New Mode of Conflict. So without further delay, Mr. Dr. Brian Jenkins. Thank you. I, I, I want to clarify one tiny point in the, in the introduction. I do not, and, and nor does RAND, advise private corporations. Uh, RAND is, by charter, limited to uh, its funding from agencies of the U.S. government and from philanthropic foundations, but cannot, uh, by law, by the terms of its charter, accept, uh, accept any funding or support from private corporations. That is, that is something separate. Other than that, I really thank you for the, for the super buildup. Unless some cataclysmic event occurs in the next 13 months, future historians looking back on the 1970s will almost certainly identify this as the decade of the terrorist. Uh, terrorism has become part of our daily news diet. Hardly a day goes by without news of an assassination, a bombing, a kidnapping, uh, a terrorist incident uh, somewhere in some part of the world. Indeed, in some respects, I think that terrorism has almost reached its Baroque stage. Uh, it certainly has inspired novelists, TV talk shows, Fashion designers in Europe this spring made it fashionable to wear something the Parisians were calling terrorist chic. Um, it has even inspired, I, I think, the, the latest manifestation was in the Miss Teenage America pageant. An 18-year-old contestant to test her linguistic skills was asked a question about international terrorism. Well, it simply has been demonstrated repeatedly in the last uh, few years that by using terrorist tactics, small groups with a limited capacity for violence can achieve disproportionate <coughs> effects. Uh, they've been able to attract attention to themselves and to their causes. They've been able to cause worldwide alarm. 
They've compelled governments to uh, devote a vast amount of resources, money, manpower, the attention of senior officials, uh, to the crisis situations that they are able to create, and to do so often before a worldwide audience. Well, this evening I'd like to talk about the theory of terrorism, the strategy and tactics of terrorism, and of special interest uh, given the uh, forum this week, the future of terrorism, what we might look ahead to in this area, and the societal effects that this may, this may have. But let's really start at the beginning. When we talk about terrorism, what are we talking about? Uh, there is no precise definition to the term. It's used promiscuously in the press. It's often used as a pejorative term. Uh, in fact, the fact that it is defined politically rather than being defined in some neutral fashion is often a major, uh, a major problem. It is often described in the news media as mindless violence, senseless violence, irrational violence. It is none of these. Terrorism is not mindless violence, not senseless, not irrational. This is not to say that terrorists think as you or as I, but simply to say that terrorism does have a theory. And from the point of view of the terrorists, the theory often, often works. Terrorism can be described simply as violence or the threat of violence calculated to create an atmosphere of fear and alarm, which will in turn cause people to exaggerate the strength of the terrorists and the importance of their cause. Terrorists undertake actions that in themselves are militarily insignificant, but are designed, choreographed, stage managed, we might say, to gain worldwide attention. Then terrorists count on domestic and international pressure to achieve what they might not be able to achieve militarily by themselves. Terrorism is thus violence for effect, not primarily, and sometimes not at all for the physical effect on the actual target, but rather for its dramatic effect, for its psychological effect, on an audience. Terrorism is aimed at the people watching. Terrorism is, in a sense, theater. And it's hard to get across this concept of, of, of terrorism. And I know in talking to one of the classes here this morning, I, I tried to describe it in the following terms. According to uh, a play I saw in New York several years ago, um, not a Broadway production by any stretch of the imagination, a play put on by one of these political theatrical groups in a theater about one-third the size of this auditorium, but with about as twice as many people packed in tightly together. And I forget what most of the play was about. Most of it was a series of, of silly episodes. But at one point in the play, the actors and actresses lined up on a stage, and the first one took out this glass mason jar, unscrewed the lid, reached in, took out a live butterfly, held this butterfly up for everyone to see, and released it. The butterfly fluttered off somewhere into the front rows. The second actor did the same thing, took out a glass mason jar, unscrewed the lid, reached in, took out a live butterfly, held it up for the audience to see, and released it. And this one flew off somewhere into the, into the stage lights. The third one took out a glass mason jar, reached in, took out a live butterfly, held it up for the audience to see, struck a match, and burned the butterfly in front of the audience. Now think about that for a moment. Think of the shock that I felt, a certain amount of revulsion. It was a trivial act of violence, to be sure. I mean, we all swat flies, step on an ant, something like that. But this one choreographed in such a way to achieve this deliberately dramatic effect, and it worked. The people in the front row were ready to leap up on a stage and strangle a bastard that had, that had burned this butterfly. Had they taken up a collection, a ransom for the butterfly that evening, I have no doubt that they could have collected a thousand bucks to save the life of this butterfly. Well, if you understand that episode, kind of deliberate choreography of this incident of violence to achieve that dramatic effect on the people watching, then you get some idea of how this concept of terrorism works. And of course, developments in world communications, particularly in the news media, have expanded the potential audience to national and more recently to international proportions. By means of dramatic acts of violence, terrorists can gain worldwide attention and mobilize national and international support for their struggle. In fact, the relationship between the actor and the audience can be almost reciprocal. Uh, radio, and especially television, allows an expanding audience to participate vicariously in the terrorist struggle through the, 
Mass media terrorists could arouse, frighten, evoke sympathy, even create some kind of a strange bond with a distant audience, and the reactions of this audience could well affect the outcome of the struggle. And it often works. Without endorsing terrorist tactics for one moment, which I deplore, it really is hard to imagine, hard to think of whether or not Yasser Arafat would have made it into the United Nations in 1974 had the Palestinians not dramatically in a very bloody fashion, brought their grievances and their cause before the eyes of the world. How many of you heard of the struggle of the South Moluccans to regain an island, uh, an island republic that many of them had never seen before the dramatic events in the Netherlands in 1975 and 1976 and 77? I mean, I know I had some vague idea that South Molucca was south of North Molucca, and that exhausted my knowledge uh, of the events. How many of you were familiar with the plight of the Croatians facing southern Slavic domination before some incidents of terrorism had been carried out by Croatians. In this country, the hijacking of a TWA airliner in 1976 and flying that to Canada and then to France demanding that their manifesto be published on page one of the, of the Chicago Tribune, New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles, and Los Angeles Times. Well, terrorist tactics can be used to publicize, to cause alarm, to disrupt, to provoke overreaction. Terrorist tactics can be used to intimidate perceived enemies, to discourage dissidents or defection, or to enforce obedience to a group, a government, or a cause. Terrorist tactics can be used by revolutionary groups, by guerrilla groups, though it is by no means synonymous with revolution or guerrilla warfare. It is a very special set of tactics. Terrorist tactics can be used by governments, although some scholars prefer a, uh, to make a purely semantic distinction, calling the actions of governments terror and calling the actions of the non-government groups sub uh, 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 terrorism. But it is purely a semantic distinction. The concept is the same. Terrorist tactics, as we have seen recently, can be used by religious cults. We shall be talking about terrorism this evening as used by non-state groups, but we must keep in mind, of course, its broader, its broader use. The use of terrorist tactics is not new. Terrorist tactics have been used for centuries. Uh, the word terror entered the political lexicon during the French Revolution. Nonetheless, there are qualitative differences about the terrorism particularly the international terrorism that we see today. You might almost say that progress has provided terrorists with new targets and new capabilities. For many of these qualitative changes are owed to technological changes that have taken place in society re recently. I'd like to mention four of these. First, transportation. Cheap, convenient, modern jet air travel, the kind of thing that makes it possible for me to be here this evening and to be returning to my home in California tomorrow. The same kind of thing that provides terrorists with not only a dramatic source of targets in hijacking airliners, but also provides them with worldwide mobility. And so we've seen examples of terrorists from one part of the world carrying out attacks in virtually any other part of the world. In 1972, for example, Japanese terrorists, as the movie, uh, as the movie uh, mentioned, Japanese terrorists recruited in Japan, trained in North Korea, additional training in the Middle East, pick up weapons, documentation in one European country, board a plane in another European country, get off that plane at Lode Airport in Israel, and begin machine gunning passengers, most of whom ironically do turn out to be Puerto Rican pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land, all of this done in the name of the cause of the Palestinians. If that isn't international, I don't know uh, what is, and that's certainly made possible by these developments in transportation. Perhaps more important than the developments in transportation have been the developments in communications, to which I've alluded already. Radio, television, communication satellites, the kinds of things that make it possible to broadcast almost instantaneously throughout the world these dramatic incidents of terrorism, that these dramatic incidents of violence the terrorists are capable of creating. And they know there's drama in this, whether by macabre ways of killing or maiming their victims, or by seizing hostages, placing human life in the balance. This is genuine human drama. And they get the instantaneous worldwide coverage. And if we think of terrorism, as I have described here, 
as a form of theater designed to reach an audience more so than affect the actual target of that violence, then one can see the enhancing of the power of terrorism through the capabilities provided by the modern news media. I don't want that to translate, however, into uh, any um, interpretation by my part that the news media is responsible for terrorism. The modern news media is responsible for terrorism today to about the same extent that the civil aviation companies are responsible for hijacking. It is a vulnerability of modern society which can be exploited by people who would use it for their own purposes. The third technological development that I think is important are the new vulnerabilities beyond communications in our society. We've already mentioned civil aviation. Terrorists in Italy recently have been striking at data processing centers and computers, causing great disruption. It is not simply the physical damage done to the computer itself, but the tremendous disruption done to the record keeping and management systems that depend on these computers, a vulnerability in our modern society. Great attention and concern is being devoted to the problem of the increased world dependence on nuclear energy, increased number of nuclear facilities, increased traffic in fissionable material and radioactive waste material, and what possibilities for malevolent mischief will this open uh, for terrorists to exploit? Liquefied natural gas, I can think of a, a dozen other vulnerabilities in modern society as it becomes increasingly dependent on often fragile technology or complex systems that can easily be disrupted. The fourth would be the increasing availability of weapons and explosives in our modern society, some weapons quite sophisticated. We tend to overlook these, uh, these developments. Perhaps they're not quite as dramatic as the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles or nuclear submarines or things of this sort. But nonetheless, if we take a longer historical view, there have been some dramatic changes. I'm an historian. One of the things I was interested in, of course, is what was it like for an assassin at the turn of the century in Russia? It was a difficult task for an assassin at that time. The bombs used by Russian terrorists on uh, street corners in Moscow attempting to blow up the Tsar, one of his officials, weighed from 6 to 12 pounds. They had these great fuming fuses and didn't always detonate uh, uh, with any degree of certainty. The assassinations had to take place in winter. You can't stand on a street corner in shirt sleeves holding a 6 to 12 pound bomb and not be identified. So they had to take place at a time when people were wearing these great coats so that these things could be concealed under. One had to identify the coach of the official, the target of the assassination. This was difficult. All the coaches were painted black. Russian terrorists wrote about this problem. And they realized that they had to identify the coaches by identifying the teams of horses pulling them. So one had to wait on this street corner in Moscow in the winter, waiting for the right team of horses to come along, then rush up and hurl this 6 or 12 pound device under the oncoming carriage, and usually oneself with it, if you've ever tried to throw something that heavily, killing, hopefully, hoping the thing would, would, would go off, killing the target. And it's not surprising that more assassins were killed in Russia than, uh, than targets of the assassination attempts. Today, we live in an age of high-powered rifles with telescopic sights, of the car bomb, the letter bomb, automatic weapons. Tomorrow, perhaps, man portable anti-tank missiles that can hit a moving car in a motorcade from a distance of several kilometers. Well, if those are the technological bases of modern terrorism, what are the political origins? Let's talk about the political roots of terrorism. Roots are popular in the, in the United States now. What are the roots of this modern wave of terrorism. I think we can trace three worthy of mention. One I would trace to the failure of the rural guerrilla warfare movements in Latin America in the mid-60s. Following the success of Fidel Castro in Cuba, there proliferated throughout Latin America a number of insurgent movements, guerrilla movements, patterned on the Cuban model, hoping to duplicate the success of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in Cuba. By the mid-1960s, by the late 1960s, with the death of Che Guevara in Bolivia, it became clear that this was not succeeding, that the Cuban success could not easily be duplicated. Most of the terrorist groups, most of the guerrilla groups, by the way, rather, they weren't terrorist groups then, most of the rural guerrilla movements had been wiped out. Where they did survive, they held a remote piece of jungle, a remote mountaintop. People hardly knew they were there. And so there was kind of a rethinking of strategy in the late 1960s, with increased attention being devoted to the struggle in the cities. And so we saw the, the birth of urban guerrilla warfare, places like Montevideo, Cordoba, Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, and Sao Paulo, as, as the guerrillas were determined to carry their struggle into the cities, 
And as cities are centers of communications and were sources of lucrative targets, there was a consequent resorting to terrorist tactics. And there is a distinction between standard guerrilla warfare and the, the special resort to terrorist tactics. Kidnapping first government officials and later foreign diplomats as a means of gaining international attention for their causes. So that would be one route. The second we would find in the Middle East, the birth of the Palestinian Revolution in 1965, when after years of frustration and waiting, the Palestinians finally decided that they had to take measures more actively in their own hands and could not depend on the Arab governments to achieve the recovery of their Palestinian homeland. Born in 1965, but more truly gaining strength in 1967 following the Six-Day War in 1967 and the disastrous defeat of the Arab armies in that war, the splendid victory of Israel, depending on your point of view, which made it clear that Israel was not going to be destroyed, that the Palestinian homeland was not going to be recovered by the force of Arab military might. And so the Palestinians resorted to the one kind of capability they really had left. They tried for a while um, to wage a campaign within the occupied territories. Uh, it did not have a great deal of success. It didn't have a great deal of success inside Israel. Cross-border raids were tried, uh, still have been carried out up until uh, this year. But really, they discovered more so that Israel's vulnerabilities were not within Israel, but rather lay abroad. Israel's vulnerabilities lay abroad where Israel could not strike back. El Al airliners, Israeli consulates and embassies abroad, prominent Jewish supporters of the state of Israel, nations which were friendly to Israel, corporations with traded, which traded with the state of Israel. Uh, these were the targets. And it fit, too, the Palestinians' conception of the state of Israel, which was a colony planted by Zionists and unfriendly Western governments in the Middle East. And so they considered it entirely legitimate to carry their struggle to the homeland, quote, the homeland of the state of Israel, just as their mentors, the Algerian guerrillas, had carried their struggle from Algiers into the metropole, into France, increasing pressure on France to get out of Algiers. And so they carried the struggle abroad. And we see the, the second route of terrorism in the Palestinian campaign, uh, which began in the late 1960s. The third route we can trace to the widespread anti-government, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in Europe, Japan, and the United States in the late 1960s. Uh, the war certainly was one of the, uh, one of the catalytic, uh, catalytic factors. Now, I don't want you to infer, I certainly don't mean to imply, that the protesters against the war were by any stretch of the imagination terrorists. But it was a radicalizing experience. It resulted in demonstrations, confrontations with police, injuries, arrests, further small-scale acts of violence, further arrests. It was a radicalizing process that spawned out on its extremist fringe tiny groups that were determined to carry on the struggle using terrorist tactics. So out of the demonstrations in Japan at Kyoto University and Tokyo University grew the Japanese Red Army. Out of the demonstrations in the cities of Germany grew the Bader Meinhof Gang and the June 2nd Group, groups that adopted foreign models, then fashionable, to continue their struggle. The Bader Meinhof Gang patterned itself on the Tupamaros in Uruguay. So those are the political roots, the initial political circumstances that led to this increase in terrorism combined with the technological changes that gave it its features we see today. Of course, since then, terrorism seems to have become kind of a a self-perpetuating phenomenon. It can be picked up by others with other grievances or causes. Right-wing Cubans, Puerto Rican separatists, South Moluccans, uh, Basques, Breton separatists, uh, any group now can use these tactics uh, in the model provided. It's important, however, to keep terrorism in some perspective. Terrorism does not threaten lives or property on a large scale. In fact, the total amount of terrorist violence in the world has been greatly exaggerated, evidence in part of its success in gaining worldwide attention. But measured against the world volume of violence, the total amount of terrorist violence is minuscule. If we talk about the international incidents of terrorism, that is, incidents where terrorists have crossed national borders to carry out their attacks, or incidents in which terrorists have selected targets because of their connection to a foreign state, say the embassy of another country, or incidents in which terrorists have attacked international lines of commerce by hijacking international airliners. If we talk about those incidents, then since 1968, 
Fewer than 2,000 people have been killed in those incidents. If we add to it the domestic political terrorism, the violence that has taken place in places like Belfast or Buenos Aires, the total ascends to something between 10,000 and 20,000. No one has a precise, a precise figure for these. Now, I don't want to sound callous about this. I don't mean to say that any single death is not shocking and tragic. But measured against the world volume of violence, 20,000 people are murdered every year in the United States alone. That's murder one, murder two, and criminal manslaughter. 20,000 people. In fact, the odds are in this country, it's a statistic I never know what to do with. The odds are three to one if you're a victim of murder in this country, you'll be at the hands of a close friend or a relative. And they say I never know quite what to do with that statistic, avoid family gatherings or what. Um, but 20,000 criminal homicides. Since 1968, Six million people have died in 13 major wars or conflicts in the world, in Indochina, in the Indian subcontinent, in the Middle East, in Africa. Six million people. So when we talk about 2,000, we're talking about a relative handful compared to this, this violent world in which we live. Indeed, if one wants to talk about slaughter on a grand scale, the so-called civilized nations of the world have demonstrated that they can do so in far grander fashion. 60 million people, civilians and soldiers, were killed in World War I and World War II. 60 million people. So when we talk about terrorism, we're talking about a relatively small portion of violence. But I don't think body counts or property damage are appropriate measures of terrorism. Terrorism is more appropriately measured by the kinds of reactions it creates in society, by the amount of attention it receives, by the resources that have to be mobilized to deal with it. These are the most accurate measures of the effects of terrorism. Well, as we are focusing on the 1980s, what can we say about the future? Will terrorism persist? Will it increase? Will it decline? The current wave of terrorism may indeed subside historically Terrorism has tended to be cyclical. The record of the currently active terrorist groups has been dismal. Except for publicity, terrorists have not achieved their stated long-range goals. The public could become sated and bored with the things terrorists do. Political extremists of the future might find terrorist tactics unproductive spectacles for when terrorism becomes commonplace. When it becomes paid 17 news, it may lose its effect. Alternatively, confronted with the declining utility of the current terrorist tactics, assassinations, kidnappings, hijackings, bombings, things of this sort, terrorists could, I suppose, escalate their violence, perhaps demonstrating a greater willingness to kill larger numbers of people. Thus far, terrorists have achieved their limited objectives without killing or even threatening to kill large numbers of people. This has been small-scale violence. But the possibility that terrorists may attempt to steal or manufacture even nuclear weapons and hold cities for ransom is no longer implausible. Certainly the ease with which even a crude nuclear explosive device can be fabricated has been greatly exaggerated. I think we've been somewhat misled by these reports of uh, undergraduate students and graduate students who can design nuclear weapons. There's a hell of a lot of difference between designing a nuclear weapon and building a nuclear weapon. Theoretically, I can design uh, an internal combustion engine. I sure as hell can't build one. To build a nuclear weapon would be an extremely hazardous undertaking. The outcome of the operation would be uncertain. The yield of the device, if it went off at all, would be unpredictable. But the bottom line is, if you ask the technical people who have more knowledge than I do about how difficult this thing is to do, the bottom line is it can be done. And there are groups in the world that possess or could acquire the resources necessary to do it. At the same time, the political utility of nuclear terrorism, upon close examination, and this is something we were talking about earlier this evening, is not so readily apparent. Impossible demands, say the demand that a government liquidate itself, would remain impossible demands, even with a nuclear threat. It could also provoke unprecedented backlash and crackdowns by governments with public support. So whether any terrorists will actually decide to go nuclear must remain for the time being an unanswerable question. 
In fact, at that point, the debate invariably tends to become sort of theological with people advancing, uh, advancing positions or defending positions on faith alone for the evidence is quite, is quite limited. Uh, in fact, even the people in that debate might almost be described in, in theological terms. There are at one end of the spectrum the apocalypticians, people who subscribe to a kind of Murphy's Law of human behavior. If something bad can be done, someone bad will inevitably do it. At the other end of the spectrum are the disbelievers who scoff at the notion of nuclear terrorism, pointing out that we are in our fourth decade of the nuclear age and nothing has happened yet, so where is the proof? I suppose in this debate I would qualify myself as a prudent agnostic. I think, however, that without attempting to predict whether terrorism will go up or decline somewhat, whatever that means, for there is no real stock market of terrorist violence, no Dow Jones quotes on terrorism. I think it's safe to say that terrorism will persist, and I use that verb carefully. It will persist as a mode of political expression, as a means of attracting worldwide attention to grievances, to causes, to the existence of groups, and as a means of achieving limited political goals. Although it is true that few terrorists can claim to have attained their, their own stated long-range goals and in that sense have failed, their use of terrorist tactics has won them publicity and often gained them some concessions. And to the politically short-sighted people who use terrorist tactics or who would use terrorist tactics, these tactical successes, I think, will suffice to preclude the abandonment of terrorist tactics. So while it may go up a bit or down a bit, the locus of violence may change in the world, I think it's safe to say it will persist. After all, subnational sub sub -national political violence in some form or another has been almost a permanent feature of political life, at least in Western Europe and Western society for the past 150 years, interrupted only by major wars. in the 1960s. Certain societal tensions, overcrowded universities, things of this sort in Europe. These conditions still exist. These will provide a reason for terrorism. New refugee populations are being created, whether the boat people of Vietnam, who might be tomorrow's Palestinians, Maronite Christians from Lebanon, white Rhodesians or white South Africans leaving their, their homeland. Any of these could provide the basis for exiled terrorist groups, as we have seen so often in the past. In addition to these traditional existing conflicts, one can see, I think, a danger in the emergence of what has been identified in this country as single-issue politics, in some cases passionately held views. And a single issue could ultimately provide the basis for terrorist violence. Our current political structures and organizations have not, in all cases, kept up with or responded effectively to our rapid industrial progress and technological advance. There's a lack of synchronization, particularly in the Western industrialized world, which does create new tensions. Some examples. We've seen the emergence of what might be called neo-Luddites, anti-technology extremists who see certain new technologies as threatening to their basic human values, and in some cases with justification. We see a declining need for labor as economies become more capital intensive at the same time that our universities are turning out increasing numbers of well-educated but unemployable students. We see modern communications have, in many cases, homogenized societies, in some cases threatening local cultures and provoking violent reactions. Whether these are Scottish nationalists, Breton separatists, Basque separatists, Corsican, Sardinians, uh, or what have you. And as we have seen most recently and tragically, even some of the new religious mysticisms and cults may lead in some cases to terrorist violence by fanatic members. If terrorism does persist, and I think it will, we can expect terrorists to remain mobile, able to strike targets anywhere in the world. We already see evidence of increasing tactical and technical sophistication on the part of the terrorists, increased use of automatic weapons, tactical skills displayed in things like the Moro kidnapping or the Schleier kidnapping, greater willingness to take on um, protected targets. Terrorists are acquiring and will continue to acquire some of the advanced weapons now being developed for modern armies. For example, handheld ground-to-air missiles with precision guidance systems. 
Links between terrorist groups in various parts of the world are increasing. The linkages seem to be more on the basis of vocation rather than uh, similarity of views and causes. In many cases, we find groups with uh, different ideologies and different aims and goals cooperating with, uh, with one another. Emerging from these links, we see freelance multinational terrorist groups, we might say, uh, are almost hired with a slogan to carry out operations on behalf of the causes they are sympathetic with, or perhaps on commission from a foreign government, although perhaps in this area uh, the Bader Meinhof gang and the Japanese Red Army are unique in providing almost terrorist mercenaries, which can be used for a variety of causes in the world. In some places, we see terrorism becoming a part of a semi-permanent subculture as preceding generations of terrorists are able to inspire and create second and third and fourth generations of terrorists, as we have seen, for example, in West Germany. In some cases, today's terrorist groups are emerging as tomorrow's new mafias as they begin to acquire a cash flow from bank robberies and kidnappings and extortion. Some of them are beginning to acquire legitimate businesses, engage in protection rackets, uh, invest in, uh, in some cases, taverns, taxicab companies, construction companies. It looks very much like a, uh, like a mafia operation in some cases. Of course, one has to remember back into, uh, uh, into the history of the Middle Ages that the mafia began as a national liberation movement uh, in the 12th century. As a consequence of these trends, I think we may foresee uh, increasing expenditures for what we might collectively refer to as internal security functions. And as terrorists can attack anything, and governments cannot protect everything, one of the points made by the movie, we can also foresee increasing expenditures for security in the private sector. This is already taking place. And finally, we foresee a proliferation of what might be called protected inner perimeters, uh, the extension of the kinds of security measures now in effect at airports to public buildings corporate headquarters, walled communities, security condominiums, fortified homes, the increasing use of bodyguards by business executives, and armored cars for travel in between protected perimeters. It's almost a medieval vision of society. Certainly the moats and the armor and the gates have changed form. We now have armor plate. We have LexGuard. We have electronic surveillance cameras. Uh, on things. We have metal detectors. But conceptually, the thing is still the same. A friend of mine is an architect, and he was talking to me about a corporate headquarters being constructed. And the executive suite of this corporate headquarters will be lined with two-inch steel plate to deal with the possibility of bombs. And he was talking also in the same firm. They're designing a bank building in San Francisco. And they were bragging about the design. San Francisco is a place that has had a bombing problem. The bank has no windows on the first two floors that can be blown out by a bomb. I don't know if that's an architectural achievement or rather sad commentary on the state of society uh, when, one, when one forecasts that as an achievement. Even the kind of security at, air, uh, at airports now would 10 years ago have been unimaginable. Had somebody told me 10 years ago on the way to the airport, well, Brian, there's a few things you're going to have to do before you get aboard that plane. Your luggage is going to be x-rayed. Your hand luggage is going to be searched. You're going to be frisked. You're going to walk through a metal detector. All of this is going to take place in front of an armed guard. I would have said, no, never happened. Not here in the United States. This is a free society. Unlawful search and seizure. I'll call my lawyer. All of those things. And yet now we accept it as part of the norm. And as I say, I think we foresee a proliferation of these protected inner perimeters uh, throughout society. This atomization of society into smaller protected perimeters, I think may reflect some developments at the international level as well. One of the major political developments of the post-World War era has been the breakup of empires and the proliferation of new nations. This proliferation of new sovereign nations has been accompanied by centrifugal pressures within nations facing ethnic separatist pressures or single-issue interest groups, in some cases expressing themselves through through terrorism. The nation state, which has been the basis for political authority and legitimacy for the past several centuries, is being challenged and eroded. And it may ultimately lose its monopoly of authority and power. What we see is, as a result of new vulnerabilities in our society, 
As a result of these new weapons capabilities, as a result of the demonstrated utility of terrorist tactics to publicize, to coerce, the power to publicize, to disrupt, to destroy, to coerce by threatening those things is descending to smaller and smaller groups. The capacity for violence once possessed by armies is coming into the hands of groups the size of gangs whose grievances, real or imaginary, it will not always be possible to satisfy. Or to put it another way, the small bands of irreconcilables, of fanatics, of lunatics that have always existed throughout the history of mankind are becoming an increasingly potent force to be reckoned with. And certainly this will pose a major challenge, particularly to democratic societies where governments rule by consent of the government, consent of the governed, and resolve differences, hopefully by peaceful debate. Well, whether we look forward to a world of increased social control by governments responding to the violent actions of tiny minorities, or whether we look forward to a medieval society of walls and armor within a political shell of existing states, I can say. But the world of future, in fact, could look very much like the world of the Italian Renaissance, the world of, of Machiavelli. We have had periods of history like this. What is clear, however, is that while terrorists are tiny minorities with limited capabilities, and little real power, their actions may nonetheless be symptomatic of, or may be the forerunners of, fundamental changes in political organization and society. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time.